no problem. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sheila Hagney. I am the lead Safe and Together officer for East, North and South Ayrshire. Um, I've asked Joanna to do my slides today because I, I cannot trust multitasking in technology is absolutely not my thing. Um, so thank you, Joanna. Um, so basically, um, I'm in a unique position um, where my sole role is to implement the Safe and Together model. Um, across three local authorities. Um, so I thought it would be remiss of me um, to not come along here today and just talk to you a little bit about my experiences, but I'm also really aware that we're hurtling towards brew time. So um, a lot of what's been discussed by North Lanarkshire and Highland already um, was kind of in my presentation. So I'm going to try and keep things like kind of brief um, and hopefully just, you know, I can, you know, what, what we're doing over in the Ayrshires can maybe sort of help um, with your implementation or, or, you know, give you ideas, but also um, I am happy to tech on ideas too. So this is a two-way process. So, you know, any advice coming this way, I am more than happy to, to tech on. So I'll take the, the next slide, please, Joanna. So as I, yeah, so basically, as I said, I'm working across three local authorities. Now they're three very close knit local authorities, but as you can understand, any, every local authority works differently. However, um, South, North and East, they have a shared vision and that's that's really important. Um, they again, and they, these tie in really well with the safe and together ethos and also what equally safe are saying just about, you know, cultural change. You know, we want Ayrshire to be a safe place for, for, for women and children, again, you know, away from violence of any form. And we're talking coercive control, emotional abuse, everything. Um, services and systems have to be um, built on a foundation of domestic abuse informed practice um, with everybody using that shared language and consistent approach. And again, that's like the root of safe and together. But also, you know, families who are affected by domestic abuse, we want to recognise them as experts in their own lives. And, you know, their management of risk should be central to assessments. It should be central to support. And that is what the, the Ayrshires are looking to achieve by implementing the safe and together model. Um, so next slide, please, Joanna. So what I'll do is I'll just give you a general overview of the three and there are differences between the three. So I'll just kind of put those out there as, as they arise. But basically, um, I've been in post since September. So again, not long. Um, and there's been a power of work done across the Ayrshires before I came into post. Um, so unfortunately, I cannot take credit for a lot of this progress. Um, so training um, is a multi-agency um, affair like it's across every everyone every sort of service in child welfare and protection and um, in all the air shares and um, we've got really inspired multi-agency practitioners just linking in with any sort of practitioner whether they're a health visitor or a school nurse people are very very excited about the model and um, obviously we've, we've talked about champions and stuff already but actually we, we're taking it one step further in the airships and what we're trying to do is make it a real opportunity for people to develop based on their own sort of development you know, per professional development needs um so we're looking at particularly in social work because i think there's, there's quite a breadth of different potential roles we've got people that are, are going into sort of duty consultations we've got people that are leading on sort of group work we've got people that are doing individual peer support and what we're doing just now is we're building up the confidence of those champions to really get themselves involved in things that really interest them auditing as well is another thing um, and over the course of the next few months we'll be sort of you know working out sort of specifically what things we need to put in in like the assessment processes such as you know coaching and that sort of thing so it's really about like not just having champions to just roll out the model it's like people really getting value out of the the model itself but also what they can sort of do in terms of their own professional development our implementation groups are multi-agency of course but in one of the airshows it's it's a, a service manager level so it's like kind of a senior manager level um, representation across agencies. That's really positive because it means decisions can be made. It's that top down approach um, and you know that there's a real drive. Plus it, you know, with these the, the senior managers, they're all getting training in the module too. Um, but another airshare is using um, a sort of closer to practice approach and their kind of first line manager levels, um, sort of team manager, senior social work, whatever you would call that, clinical team leader. Um, represent the um, 
implementation group on that side. And there's benefits to that too, because we know our senior management on across all the airshows um, are really behind this model and implementing it. Um, but when you have an implementation group with that kind of lower sort of hierarchy management, um, it just means a lot more things can get done quicker on the ground. So there's actually pros and cons of, of different sort of levels in your implementation groups, but it's certainly something to think about. Um, evaluation activities um, are a key, a key um, activity, I suppose, just now. And one airshow is really ahead in all their training. And, you know, I would say like 90 percent of social work certainly have been through training. So the evaluation around that is what are the learning needs, like what's been embedded in and what isn't. And then in another air share, it's just at the very beginning of their journey. So it's a complete baseline. Um, and that's been done for self-assessment and case file auditing. Probably the most important part of um, the evaluation activity, though, is the lived experience work that we're doing. And women's aid in each of the three local authority areas are supporting me to do an activity in terms of lived experience and this will be the most important bit, the, the whole sort of implementation process, because we're not just looking for sort of, you know, how was the support you received when, you know, you were working with social work with a health visitor, you know, it's not a satisfaction thing. It's not rate your service. It's about what what did our involvement mean for your safety? Um, and it's did we make you feel more unsafe? Did we actually increase risk? Because as been mentioned already, um, let's be honest, our plans, traditional, traditional, you know, multi-agency practice is rooted in you need to end the relationship, you need to flee, um, you need to call the police, when actually, you know, the evidence tells us that these can actually be highly risky strategies, but they're the root of every child protection plan, aren't they, in, in you know, um, in the, the way we've, we've been practicing. So really, this lived experience exercise is it's going to be like the root of keeping people going with this, I think, and reminding us that we cannot go back to the, the kind of, I call it traditional practice, I don't know if that's appropriate, um, but for, for the purposes of what I'm talking about, just to remind us that it's so important that we don't go back to that traditional practice. And it's going to be really eye-watering, um, it's going to be painful, I would imagine, but we, we've got to we've got to hear it, to be honest, if, and to, to really inform how the model's been implemented and what what we need to know and what we need to do next so so yeah so that's probably a really important piece of work that's ongoing just now and um, we've seen better outcomes and um, we have seen you know although practice maybe not isn't completely consistent everywhere we're seeing some really good outcomes when families are getting to that child protection table and um, they the conversation is very different um, I got a phone call from a head health visitor who'd come in from another local authority um, and she was just astounded by the difference in tone and where mum, she felt mum was an equal partner. Now we know that's probably not really going to be the case, there's always going to be that power imbalance, but mum really led that conversation and her understanding of risk and what she was doing to manage that was, was central to the conversation. And I think we're finding as well that less families are getting to the child protection table at all because people are starting to realise that actually there's, you know, something that the victim, the survivor, the person living with that um, domestic abuse, there is literally nothing more that they can do. So there's a real ethical question about whether you want to be going down the route of, of placing kids on a child protection register. So, so yeah, so we're, we're seeing real differences there. And, you know, I see there's, there's a lot of you here today and I've been to a lot of kind of government sort of deep dive exercises um, MARAC discussions and a real source of concern for everyone is court and court outcomes. Well, we had a social worker do her core training a couple of weeks back and she had a court report to do the next day and the model actually allowed her to articulate that the dad's behaviour, dad was seeking like high level of contact and I think he was having contact and she was able to say all his behaviours, although not directed specifically at the children, were impacting on the children because he was basically terrorising mum um, and that his behaviour was a parent in choice and she was also of the view that he had no interest in the kids he just wanted to, to find another way to get to mum and actually the sheriff looked at that um, report and said Do you know what 
you're not getting any contact till you go on a 12 week parenting course and that guy just walked out of court now I don't know you might have been upset but it kind of fed into the social worker's view that he wasn't really interested in the kids it was a method of sort of control and abuse but again just one person going the impact that one social worker has had on that family's life has been phenomenal just by doing that bit of um just going on that training so so yeah so that's some of the the, the progress that we've made and um, if you could give me the next slide joanna um i can maybe talk about the trickier side of implementation um, achieving change not quite so easy and um, but we've separated it into kind of two approaches strategic approach um, and practice approach and again one of the things that we've looked at is readiness to change people's readiness to change and you know a lot of you will be heading services and you know you'll be you know in senior positions and you'll look down and you'll know like the culture of your service your team or whatever but actually when you start stripping that back there's little pocket cultures there's you know there's different things that you know impact on people on a daily basis and we all know certainly from the social work side of things where I come from and um, is there's never a good time to implement any change especially change on this phenomenal cultural level and um, but actually we found just by talking to people finding out what people's anxieties were and um, and actually just spending that bit of time talking to team managers talking to service managers and just getting a sense of where people are people are exhausted after covid you know it's you know people are getting back in at the swing of things and people just cannot handle another change but actually when you talk to people you can get around that so readiness to change has been a key foundation to the implementation plans as I've said, I'm working over three local authorities and as much as they're tight knit, as much as they've got a shared vision, you know, the, demogra uh, the demographics are different, the geography is different, service structure is different, everything, everything is different. So you, we can't go in with the same implementation plan for both. So and um, for all three. So we are there has there's a lot of sort of overarching similarities, but actually we find that sort of delving into the specifics and what sort of the the training needs and the learning needs and the readiness to change really do actually take those implementation plans in a completely different direction so i suppose i just kind of want to highlight that because if you're listening today and you're thinking uh well you know my my area my team my service is not in a position to make those changes just now i would say that if you are looking at readiness to change if you're taking some of these you, you could be you, you could absolutely be in a in a, in a position to, to start to embed change and um, because these three local authorities are actually very different as well as being very similar so um, and the last thing in terms of strategy um as mike talked before about child protection committee and violence against women partnership and um, for all the reasons that he spoke about like they are key key ad adult protection to adult protection committees as well but um, when you're making any sort of large scale cultural changes or anything like that, if we're addressing risk over here, we might accidentally inadvertently create risk over here. Um, system generated risks, other kind of risks, unintended consequences. And that's an area that worries me. And it's not something that we've come across as a particular issue so far. But I find if you keep your plans scrutinised by the various committees and partnerships, and um, that is a good way of managing that side of things. So that's like a crucial part of our implementation plan. Is there anything we're missing? Are we inadvertently creating difficulties somewhere else? So in terms of practice, um, again, there's been talk about practice and like there's nobody across the areas that I've spoken to that is against this model in any way, shape or form. Everybody loves it. But actually what we know is training alone is not enough. Um, and because the model is so sort of vast and wide, you'll maybe find that, that practitioners across agencies will be really good at one area, but might struggle with another area. And actually what we don't want when we're trying to kind of get that ripple effect, domino effect of enthusiasm by targeting people, the right people for training and getting champions on board. What we don't want is the other thing to happen is for workers not to be supported. And actually there's like a negative domino effect. Oh, this model's rubbish, blah, blah, blah. I have had people say to me, and this is over the course of the years I've been doing sort of safe and together, and um, things like um, this model is actually placing kids at more risk. Um, or um, the situation's too risky or too complicated to use that model. And what I would say is it's it's a mod, it, it's basically, it's just a model. It's just 
it's just tools and um, it doesn't create if it's been used properly it doesn't create risk it doesn't you know it can't you don't throw it out the window at the point it gets tricky and certainly as a social worker myself I find myself in the position that when I've got a kid at risk in front of me you panic you go into like I need a protect mode you need to do this failure to protect narrative so it's been really important that we have our confident champions and that is the lead officer that I'm available particularly at this point in implementation for the first couple of years that we can really help people when they're struggling to use the model or when they're feeling overwhelmed or if they're feeling the risk is too high. That is a really, really important strategy to have in place to make sure that people can actually use the model and don't go straight back into kind of victim blaming. So, um, oh my goodness, I realise what the time is. Apologies, people will be choking for a cup of tea. So I will start, I will move on to the next slide if you don't mind, Joanna. Um, the opportunities that I found arising from like implementation of the Safe and Together model, and yes, it links back to the vision, we're wanting cultural change, but actually just to drill down on a couple of these things a little bit more. Um, obviously, we're looking at local change, we're wanting the airships to be a much safer place, but there's a real there's a real opportunity for national change here and again the practitioner forum that we're all involved in that we've talked about and the improvement service of bringing all the leads and other people involved in implementation together as well to just to do more informal sort of you know information sharing and learning from each other and i'm particularly excited about that and um, because you know given what we know about domestic abuse and why it exists it actually doesn't need to exist in this society. So, you know, there's a lot, excuse me, there's a Shih Tzu joining me here. And um, there's, you know, there's a lot um, that we can do on a national scale to, to really change things in Scotland. And we're already ahead of the game with the legislation that we've got and the fact that everyone's signing up to the Safe and Together model. So it's really, I think there's a real opportunity for real national change here. Um, now, if you do come from a, a, a direct practice, um, background, you're, you're going to think I'm really full of it now, but aligning multi-agency thresholds. Now, yes, we know like sh systems, shared language, that's going to create that, but actually seeing it in action, when you bring together the different um, agencies and you're talking about and you're doing this reflective exercise, when you see like your health visitor, your um, social worker, your justice worker all getting on the same page and having the same thresholds because they're using the model, that's a lovely thing. That, it's, it's really, and you know, obviously that will build and develop over time. I've mentioned individual practitioner development already, and it's the opportunity for people to really own this and thrive off it. It's not just about them, you know, helping embed a model. Um, but I suppose just thinking about the sum of everything that we're doing is about getting families where they want and need to be and just making sure that we put that accountability in the, in the right place and this this is the only opportunity I see to actually do that. So we, we absolutely have to take this on. Um, so my final slides. Do I have a fine? Yes, I do. I thought I thought I did. OK, so just very briefly, the next steps for the year is, is, yeah, we're doing a lot of measuring activities and evaluation now, but I have been in touch with the care inspectorate um, about, you know, expectations and we'll develop those evaluation tools going forward. But I think encouraging words, and maybe don't quote me just in case this is, but what I took from a discussion with the care inspector is that no one's expecting complete change overnight, but we're wanting to see things moving in the right direction. And I think that's really important for people to understand it. It's going to be a process bit by bit. It's not easy to do. And um, so that's if, you know, if your listeners is thinking, whoa, we are not in a position to do that. Just think bit by bit. It's not overnight change. We're expanding our reach. We've got meetings with the Children's Reporter. We've got housing on board for training next year. We've got addictions on board for training next year. Addictions have been very important. Um, police, we're expanding out into the, we're, we're going to be doing work around IR initial referral discussions, MARAX, and again, police are involved with that. So we're really expanding out in 2023 out with the, the, the main sort of agencies. And then finally, all I would say is um, we'll be keeping an eye on any change in service demands from using this model. And again, I think Anna said earlier just about, you know, the majority of guys are not in involved in the, the justice system. So where are all these guys and what are we going to do with them? So that is something that I'm quite interested in taking forward in my post in the next couple of years. And like, you know, what is that demand going to be and what should we be? 
what should be doing. So, so yeah, so that is pretty much the long and the short of what we're doing over there. I hope that I've been able to bring some useful informant and information. Um, but I suppose that the whole point of what I'm saying is, you know, regardless of wherever you work or whatever you're doing, you know, you can bring something to sort of implementation in your role. So I will stop talking. <laughs>